Hi, my name is Megan Moynihan. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for Functional Restoration at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Today I want to talk about the challenges of commercialization in the neurotechnology space. And then I want to discuss whether de-risking is actually an effective strategy for addressing these issues. And then I want to introduce some of our own attempts to commercialize and talk about generally who bears the risks when commercialization attempts are not successful. Hopefully the reason you're taking this course is that you have an interest in developing innovative neurotechnologies like new therapeutic treatments, methods of rehab, imaging, or diagnostic tools. And chances are you're motivated by the idea of addressing the underlying neurological disorders. Maybe you have a specific patient population in mind where you feel like your concept could address their unmet needs. So if you're writing about these populations in the background section of your grants or in your publications, then it might be a good idea to reflect on the fact that these are in fact the people who are waiting for your new great idea. They are reading about it and they're wondering whether they can have access to it. So the reality is these are, these are populations that represent small markets and that can make translation very challenging. So we've often been told that that means that you as the investigator have to carry the baton further down the track in, in order to de-risk the path for industry and that that's what it's gonna take to be successful. And so today I wanna show by way of a case example where some of those ideas make sense and whether they might fall short sometimes. One of the things you'll hear a lot is that when there's little interest on the part of commercial partners, investigators should try to carry the baton further down the track and to try to de-risk the path for industry in order to interest them. What we mean by that is not just working to bring neurotechnologies into prototype or into early human experience, but to really work even harder to potentially carry out a multi-center clinical trial or even complete a pivotal clinical trial um, as part of the effort to de-risk this pathway. The idea is that researchers should be able to get funding for these later stages of translation and hopefully line up an industry partner in the meantime in order to bring the product over the finish line. And so how realistic is this as a strategy? Today I want to share our own experience trying to commercialize the Case Western Reserve University network neuroprosthesis. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about the technology itself. Um, it's an example of an active implantable medical device. It is intended to restore function for people with spinal cord injury, and it could also be used as a research platform for other applications such as stroke, pain, and autonomic function. Since its development over a decade ago, we've been working to bring this technology to commercial reality using this de-risking strategy. And so let's take a look at how that's been going. So the first area that we tried to de-risk was regulatory. One of the first things we did was try to petition the FDA to downclassify all implantable neuroprosthetics. This would have been a fantastic outcome for people with spinal cord injury because it would have lowered the bar for everybody in this space. So without going into a lot of detail, for those of you who might be skeptical, this is not an unreasonable request because it's really just a fluke of history that these devices are class three to begin with. We had argued that the entire class of products should be considered moderate risk or class two. But in the end, the strategy appears to have failed because we've never heard anything back from the FDA on our petition and their most recent round of reclassification efforts seems to have left this one out. So if we can't downclassify all neuroprosthetics, we wanted to figure out whether we could assure that our technology would be considered class two. Now, at this point, we don't know whether the outcome of this will be successful or not, because until we submit a marketing application for a class two device, the FDA doesn't really have to commit to their decision. But for the moment, we have been given the go ahead to try to submit our technology as a class two moderate risk device. And it remains to be seen whether we will be successful. Um, the next area that we approached was using the FDA's early feasibility IDE program to start our clinical trial. Now, the EFS program is supposed to be an easier on-ramp for investigators to start their clinical experience. What we've found for ourselves is a little bit of a mixed bag. Sometimes the FDA appears to understand the EFS framework and work well within it, but a lot of times we find ourselves disagreeing about the basics and also trying to re-educate new review teams. We've had multiple change-outs of our review team uh, management at the FDA um, since our early feasibility IDE began about six years ago. 
Um, one of the more successful approaches we've had has been the pre-submission program. Now this is a program where you can engage with the FDA in order to figure out your regulatory strategy or to try to pre-negotiate some of the terms of your clinical trial. A great example um, in our case was the discussion about the sample size that would be needed for a pivotal clinical trial. It took us three rounds of interaction and we did 16 different sample size calculations, but we ended up with a common understanding that a study sample size of 30 people would be sufficient to support a marketing application for our technology. Using the pre-submission process, we've also pre-negotiated many aspects of our pivotal clinical trial, including the choice of primary outcome measures, secondary outcome measures, the data collection schedule and follow-up plan, and the study hypothesis. Finally, we applied for and received FDA's breakthrough medical device designation in 2016. In its decision, the FDA agreed with our rationale that the device was considered innovative and that it addresses an unmet clinical need, um, particularly for people with spinal cord injury. So in a later slide, we'll share with you what the biggest impact of this decision has been. So to summarize, we feel that we've done a good job de-risking the regulatory pathway for a future commercial partner. We've opened the door to a potential class two designation. We've gotten the clinical trial underway. We've pre-negotiated with the FDA many aspects of the trial um, design, including the final sample size of 30 participants. So given all of that, how have we done in securing an industry partner? So for us, it's still been a mixed bag. Um, one of the more creative things we tried to do was get funding to support the translation of our manufacturing process over to our industry partner. And to do that, we wrote a grant to the state of Ohio that couched the project in terms of job creation for the company to be able to build out its R&D and manufacturing expertise. Um, and we recommend this approach of looking for novel uh, sources of funding for your project. But initially, this effort ended up failing because there wasn't a good alignment between our mission, which was to commercialize our neurotechnology for the small market of spinal cord injury, and Companies A's mission, which was to serve larger markets with much simpler technologies. And so it quickly became apparent that this wasn't a good match, and we ended up having to scramble to find a new industry partner who could benefit from the remaining funding in that award. This was when we came sort of face to face with the realities of the players in this space. There's a lot of small startups, very exciting, a lot of people getting things started, you know, trying to eke out their place in the commercial landscape. And the problem is, of course, that they're very focused on their one product or their one concept, and they're trying to get their thing done, and they just don't have the bandwidth to take on something new. So um, we also approached several of the larger strategic companies in the space, and it was pretty clear that they weren't interested either. So, but we ended up finding another small company, uh, Company B, that's already marketing in the spinal cord injury market with one product, and they were looking to expand their impact. Um, the partnership got off to a pretty easy start because the project was fully funded by us, and we shared a common mission of wanting to serve the spinal cord injury population. So I can see that we've been pretty happy with the partnership so far, and we currently have a manufacturing agreement in place with them. But I will point out that a manufacturing agreement is not a licensing agreement, nor is it an option to license agreement. And so we really can't call them our commercial partner yet. And that leaves us with a lot of uncertainty. And so that's why it's important to see what de-risking really means for industry. Because for many of us and from where we sit, you know, we see getting through the FDA as like the big milestone. But it turns out that for industry, FDA approval is really just the foothills on a longer journey. And that journey has to do with whether they can actually serve the market in a sustainable way. So if the product is FDA approved, but there's not adequate reimbursement, or if there's not a lot of uptake on the part of clinicians, or if hospitals are not willing to purchase these systems, those are the risks that industry wants to see addressed. So knowing this really explains the actions of our first industry partner, Company A, because obviously they were not willing to pivot in order to meet the market that we were driving them towards. So in our case, what we've been trying to do now is sort of de-risk the, de -risk the pathway even beyond the FDA approval. Um, in 2016, we hired a consulting group to develop a high-level reimbursement strategy document for us to follow so that we would have a game plan for getting appropriate reimbursement. 
One of the first steps they asked us to take was to request a new technology code from CMS so that during the clinical trial, all of the medical and surgical procedures would be captured in the billing records. And even though this is the code that CMS is going to need to look at in order to pull together their analysis, they didn't give us a new technology code. So that first step failed. Um, we next worked on securing funding for a multi-center clinical trial with the hopes that we could actually get it to the 30 participants needed for full FDA approval. So we had to pull together a combination of grants and philanthropy, but we basically have secured almost all the funding that we'll need to complete the trial. Um, another success has been just carrying out a you know, basic market analysis. This is something that we had done in the past, but we're really pretty excited about the fact that our new industry partner has also done a market analysis because it shows that they're interested in trying to figure out how to serve and meet these market demands. This year, we're also conducting a cost effectiveness study because this is actually the kinds of clinical trial that the clinical community values when they're deciding whether to adopt a new technology. And hospitals also look at it when they're trying to figure out whether they should be purchasing technologies. That study will be completed next year and we'll have a better idea about its impact in the future. And finally, the most unexpected success has been the fact that, as I mentioned before, in 2016, we received the breakthrough medical device designation from the FDA. Three years later, in 2019, CMS actually changed its policy so that devices with that designation would automatically receive reimbursement for the first four years following FDA approval. So obviously we couldn't have foreseen this policy change, but we clearly benefit from it and we will be taking full advantage of it when the time comes. Kind of showing you that sometimes serendipity and random luck are what factors that play into your commercialization success. So you can see that we've been talking about strategies to de-risk the pathway for industry. But when industry is not taking these risks, where does the risk go? Who's actually bearing the risk in the scenarios that we've been describing so far? Now, if you're an investigator doing a study of an implantable neurotechnology, some of that risk is borne by you and your university. And we could spend time talking about liability, the risks of not protecting IP, you know, reputational risk, that type of thing. But the people bearing the real risks are people with neurological disorders who are waiting for these technologies to come along, particularly those who are taking part in clinical trials where there's no guarantee that there will be an industry partner to help support their technology at the end of the study. Um, you know, many people with neurological disorders, they're trying to live life and do things in the face of incredible challenges. They gather hope based on reading and hearing about promising technologies like yours. So you have an op opportunity, something of an obligation, to try to address their unmet needs um, by pushing harder to commercialize your promising neurotechnology concept. All right, you're on module 16 of a 21-part series designed to inspire you to think about and pursue the idea of commercialization of neurotechnology. It's not really a series of stepping stones um, waiting for you to take a guided tour. But this idea of de-risking the path for an eventual industry partner, it's a reasonable strategy. Um, it's going to have its successes and its failures, as our case example has shown. If you can do anything to de-risk some of the later stages of commercialization, um, that's very meaningful to industry. It takes a lot of courage to plow forward despite all these obstacles that you're going to face. Um, but it's important to remember that people with disabilities are waiting for things to emerge that they can benefit from. So hopefully our case example today has inspired you to stay with it, try some novel ideas, and, uh, and different approaches. So good luck on the journey forward. And I'd like to acknowledge the financial support from the Craig H. Nielsen Foundation, the Fred A. Lennon Charitable Trust, the NINDS, and our donors.